father of King George III, Frederick, Prince of Wales, faced a life marked by curses and misfortune, including abandonment by his parents, a turbulent relationship with them, and a scandalous personal life filled with unconventional relationships and a failed artistic endeavour. Despite his aspirations, his legacy was one of turmoil and family discord. His legacy was cursed. Frederick, Prince of Wales, had a destiny met by misfortune. Instead of ascending to the throne, he ended up fathering one of history's most notorious mad kings, George III. Yet, Frederick's story is rife with more startling twists, from his astonishing rift with his parents to his abrupt and unsettling demise. Born in 1707 in Hanover, Germany, Frederick didn't always have a prominent place in the English royal lineage. His parents, George of Hanover and Caroline of Ansbach, only assumed the titles of Prince and Princess of Wales when Frederick was seven, and that, too, due to intricate geological connections and a stroke of luck. Nonetheless, Frederick and his family were now part of British royalty, which would eventually spell disaster for him. As the Prince and Princess of Wales, Frederick's parents had obligations in England. In a heartless decision, they left Frederick behind in the care of an uncle, while they took two of his siblings with them, uncertain of when they would return. The repercussions of this choice would be devastating and enduring. And even though Frederick spent his crucial formative years separated from his parents, their influence still loomed, at times unsettling. His mother, Caroline, a sharp-minded woman with a keen interest in science, enrolled him in the recently developed smallpox vaccine programme, despite limited understanding of its effects at the time. While her intentions were scientifically sound, her readiness to place Frederick in harm's way was alarming, and he didn't appreciate it when he grew older. In 1727, a pivotal moment arrived in Frederick's life when his father ascended to the throne as King George II, thereby making Frederick the Prince of Wales. At the age of 20, Frederick was finally allowed to enter England and fulfil his duties to what was essentially a foreign nation. What should have been a heartwarming family reunion took an unexpected turn. During the intervening years, Frederick underwent significant changes, not all of them positive. Raised by private tutors with little regard for his character development, he arrived in England burdened with debts from gambling and a penchant for multiple mistresses. The new king and queen of England were taken aback, and Frederick had more disappointments in store for them. Upon arriving in England, Frederick exacted revenge on his parents, who had abandoned him for 14 years. Holding a deep grudge, he openly created a rival court, compromising his parents' political adversaries. However, this move was not without its risks. Frederick's long separation from his parents meant that he didn't fully understand their capabilities. His mother, Caroline, a skilled stateswoman, knew how to wield her power effectively. Faced with her eldest son's rebellion, she showered praise on his younger brother, Prince William, and explored ways to limit Frederick's inheritance in favour of William. While she didn't succeed entirely, she had further plans in motion. Although Caroline and George couldn't completely disinherit their son, as it turned out, they didn't need to. They found a way to prevent him from amassing more power. In a stinging move for the times, whenever King George was absent, it was Caroline, not Frederick, who acted as regent. This was a significant blow to Frederick, highlighting his need for parental guidance. As Frederick settled into court life, he displayed concerning behaviour, particularly his poor judgement in choosing companions. His close friendship with Lord John Hervey, a notorious court gossip and provocateur, shed light on the questionable company that he kept and the flawed character traits that attracted him. Together, Frederick and Hervey embarked on a disastrous journey. In addition to his penchant for scandalous affairs, Frederick had a deep appreciation for the arts and music. This led him and Hervey to embark on a rather unique endeavour, co-writing a theatrical comedy. In 1731, they staged their creation of Drury Lane, with Frederick adopting the pseudism Captain Bodkin for the occasion. 
However, judging by that rather cringeworthy pen name, their collaboration turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. Here's a valuable lesson: wealth and privilege do not automatically translate into artistic talent. It's reported that Frederick and Hervey's pet project was so horrendous that the manager of Drury Lane was convinced it wouldn't survive its opening night, regardless of royal patronage. In fact, he was so certain of its impending failure that he took drastic measures. Recognizing the importance of upholding his reputation, the manager devised an ingenious, albeit extreme, plan. On the night of Frederick's playing, he stationed soldiers within the audience to maintain order. Once the audience realized how dreadful the performance was, his foresight proved correct. The play flopped. The soldiers quelled the irate audience, and refunds were issued. Yet Frederick, now armed with scandal, was just getting started. Even amid these controversies, Frederick managed to find new ways to antagonize his parents. Shortly after his arrival in England, he dropped a shocking bombshell on his mother. He was officially taking Anne Vane, one of her ladies in waiting, as his mistress. And when it came to Anne Vane, well, Frederick had met his match. Anne Vane hailed from lineage of audacious women, with her own mother being as famous as a scandalous figure in court. Embracing this legacy, Vane had her fair share of lovers, with Frederick merely being one of them. However, she soon became the source of more than just gossip in Frederick's court. During the 1730s, Frederick faced a momentous revelation: Anne Vane was pregnant, though to his day the true father remains a mystery. Several individuals, including Frederick and Lord Harrington, were considered possible candidates. Nevertheless, Vane gave birth in the Royal St James's Palace, indicating her enduring relationship with Frederick. But Vane had a clever plan in mind. In a bold and strategic move that showcased her mastery of the role of mistress, Vane named her newborn son Fitz Frederick, a name signifying son of Frederick. If one cannot definitely identify the father of their child. Why not choose the most powerful one? Vane's maneuvering, however, was destined to create a fresh rift in Frederick's life. Now, here's a sensational twist I've been holding back, mainly because it's too juicy to reveal all at once. Brace yourself! Another of Anne Vane's lovers happened to be none other than Frederick's closest friend, Lord Hervey, the notorious court gossip. While they managed to navigate their love triangle for a while, the birth of young Fitz Frederick appeared to change everything. Hervey purportedly asserted that Fritz Frederick was his own son, leading to a falling out between him and Frederick around the time of the child's birth. Yet these weren't the only changes Frederick would soon face. Frederick, Prince of Wales, embarked on a tumultuous path to marriage, motivated by financial gain rather than love. He manipulated and mistreated his young wife Augusta, and used her as a tool in his conflicts with his parents, resulting in a series of absurd and cruel situations within the royal family. Despite the ongoing turmoil in his relationship with his parents, King George and Queen Caroline, the mid 1730s, brought about a pressing matter for Frederick. As the heir to the British throne, he urgently needed to marry and start producing legitimate heirs. One unquestionably his own. In typical House of Hanover fashion, this endeavour turned into a spectacle. One might assume that arranging the marriage of the supposed future King of England would be straightforward. However, Frederick's part in matrimony was a calamity, largely due to his actions. Initially, Frederick's father was in negotiations for him to marry the daughter of the King of Prussia. However, royal marriage negotiations can be protracted, and Frederick, never known for his patience or maturity, grew tired of waiting. Defying his father's wishes, he sent his own envoy to Prussia to expedite the process, infuriating King George and effectively scuttling the entire arrangement. Well done, Frederick. But then again, he wasn't exactly motivated by the purest of intentions in pursuing marriage. Rather than seeking true love. Frederick had his sights set on a substantial dowry from his bride. His extravagant lifestyle had led him deep into gambling debts, and the Prince of Wales needed a financial bailout. 
When Lady Diana Spencer, one of the wealthiest women in England, emerged as a potential wife, Frederick eagerly seized the opportunity. Regrettably, the government and his parents did not share his enthusiasm, and Frederick was back to square one. This led to a particularly heartless turn of events. By 1736, Frederick, at the age of 29, had grown wary of the pursuit of both love and money, or rather, a wealthy spouse. When his parents proposed Princess Augusta of Saxe Gotha, a 16-year-old German princess with minimal worldly experience, Frederick essentially conceded, stating that he would marry whomever they choose, as long as she bought enough money into the marriage. It was far from a fairy tale beginning and would soon take a darker turn. Augusta arrived in England without knowing a word of English, leaving her with limited avenues of support beyond the German royal family. Furthermore, she had little time to get used to the idea as her wedding to Frederick took place almost immediately in May 1736. This whirlwind introduction left her ill-prepared for what Frederick had in store for her. In the early months in England, Frederick's new wife, Augusta, appeared as a pitiful figure. The teenager's youth and naivety were on full display, with observers often seeing her through palace windows playing with her dolls. It was not a confident image for the new Princess of Wales, and Frederick's sister had to persuade Augusta to put away her toys to avoid further embarrassment. However, Frederick's counsel to his young wife was far from compassionate. During this period, Frederick severed ties with his former mistress Anne Vane and became involved with Lady Hamilton, another English aristocrat. Tragically for Frederick, his marriage to Augusta hindered his ability to see Lady Hamilton whenever he pleased. Additionally, rumours about their relationship circulated throughout the palace, making secret rendezvous more challenging. In the face of these challenges, Frederick hatched a devious plan. In one of the most callous manoeuvres ever recorded, Frederick exploited Augusta's innocence to resolve his affair with Lady Hamilton. He vehemently denied the truth of the rumours about him and Lady Hamilton to Augusta and convinced her to appoint Hamilton as lady-in-waiting. This, of course, gave him unrestricted access to his indisputable mistress away from prying eyes. In a distressing tale, and yet Frederick's most insidious betrayal was yet to come. As previously mentioned, Queen Caroline, Frederick's formidable mother, was a dominant figure, often taking the lead in her relationship with the king. However, Frederick, in his quest to do anything contrary to his parents, deliberately distanced himself from Augusta for the majority of their marriage. He vowed never to confide in her as his consort, but this didn't prevent him from making a sinister request of her. Frederick's parents may have hoped that marriage would temper his behaviour, or, at the very least, keep him from being a nuisance. Instead, it unleashed his darker tendencies. Realising he could use Augusta as a pawn in his schemes, he instructed her to actively snub his parents, effectively deploying her as a frontline soldier in his petty family feud. The consequences of this manipulation were nothing short of absurd. Frederick's ingenuity is insulting his parents seemed boundless. At one point, he insisted that Augusta always arrive at the chapel after his mother, Queen Caroline. While this may appear to be a minor matter, it meant that the timid Augusta had to rudely push past Caroline every time to reach her own seat. When Caroline caught on and directed Augusta to use a different entrance, Frederick retaliated by instructing his wife to refuse to enter the chapel altogether if Caroline had arrived before her. Astounding as it may be, this was just the tip of the iceberg. Among all this turmoil, Frederick incessantly badgered his parents for money, even with Augusta's dowry. It was never enough. He would engage in almost physical altercations with his father over the necessity for Parliament to provide him with a larger allowance to sustain his vices, further deepening the rift between parent and son. However, Frederick was about to exact a significant revenge. Though initially naive, Augusta quickly adapted to the realities of married life. By 1737, she was expecting her first child with Frederick. It should have been a joyous time at the palace, but instead it triggered an unprecedented feud. 
Upon learning of Augusta's pregnancy, Queen Caroline reportedly insisted on being present at the birth, implying that the baby's legitimacy might be in question, and it was necessary royal supervision. Frederick, however, was not prepared to accept this, and his reaction was almost unbelievable. He forced his pregnant wife into an unbearable situation. In July 1737, Augusta went into labour. Instead of providing any assistance, Frederick immediately compelled her to hastily enter a carriage and endure a one and a half hour journey, all while in labour, mind you, to the remote St James's Palace. His motive? To thwart his mother's insistence on being present at the birth. The situation rapidly deteriorated from there. Upon their arrival at the palace, Frederick and Augusta shot the skeleton crew of servants who were unprepared for guests, let alone a woman in labour. There was no suitable birthing bed or linens available, and consequently Augusta, in dire straits, gave birth to their daughter, little Princess Augusta, on a tablecloth. Yes, you heard that correctly. Nevertheless, the ordeal was far from over. Prince Frederick, son of King George II and Queen Caroline, had a tumultuous relationship with his parents, marked by bitterness and public humiliation. Despite later attempts at reconciliation, his early actions and animosity with his mother and father had lasting consequences, ultimately leading to a troubled legacy for his son, King George III. Queen Caroline possessed an extensive network of informants which quickly alerted her to her despised son's actions. She promptly hurried to St James's Palace, accompanied by Frederick's former best friend, Lord Hervey. Once there, she took the opportunity to shower the new parents with insults. Reportedly, the Queen made it abundantly clear how delighted she was that they had welcomed a poor, ugly little she-mouse, as nobody would mistake an illegitimate girl as a legitimate heir. If there was ever was a beginning to Frederick's relationship with his parents, this marked its bitter end. Following the birth of Frederick's daughter, Queen Caroline virtually disowned her son and harboured nothing but contempt for her daughter-in-law. Recognising that everything Augusta did was orchestrated by Frederick, Caroline wants to ride it, Poor creature, was she to spit in my face, I should only pity her for being under such a fool's direction and wipe it off. Her most venomous remarks, however, were reserved for her own son. The extent of the animosity between Frederick and Caroline is difficult to exaggerate. On one occasion, she delivered one of history's cruelest insults to her son. According to Lord Hervey, she once spotted Frederick walking and exclaimed, Look, there he goes, that wretch, that villain. I wish the ground would open the moment and sink the monster to the lowest hole in hell. Imagine hearing those words from your own mother. Now imagine your mother was the Queen of England. Nevertheless, Frederick had more mischief in store, particularly concerning his father. Around this time, public support for Frederick's parents began to dwindle, particularly as his father frequently left the country and his mother assumed more regent duties. At one point, a prankster posted a notice on one of the royal residences, humorously critiquing George, lost or strayed out of this house, a man who has left a wife and six children. For Frederick, it must have been a source of petty delight. However, more was in store for him. The end of 1736, Frederick's father hurried back from a trip to Hanover in an attempt to placate his disgruntled subjects. Tragedy struck en route. The king's ship encountered a severe storm and many feared that he had perished. Rather than feeling a shred of grief, Frederick perceived this as a cunning opportunity. Reports of the king's demise had been greatly exaggerated and King George II returned to England in 1737, alive but physically drained. He was feverish and urgently required rest. This was precisely when Frederick seized his chance. The Prince of Wales fueled rumours by asserting that the king was genuinely on his deathbed. He then sat back and watched the ensuing chaos unfold. As the news spread, everyone assumed that Frederick, being the king's son, was a reliable source. The court was thrown into a panicked frenzy over the news. This effectively compelled King George to leave his sickbed and attend a social event to prove that he was not, in fact, dying. Frederick must have taken immense satisfaction from this turn of events. However, as Shakespeare reminds us, these violent delights have violent ends. Frederick was about to learn this firsthand.
With the family discord looming large, his parents delivered the ultimate blow. In the latter part of 1737, they banished Frederick, Augusta and their child from their court. The Prince and Princess of Wales packed their bags and moved to Leicester House, far removed from the epicentre of monarchy. As it turned out, this marked the final battle in the lifelong war between Frederick and his parents, because neither Frederick nor his mother had much time left. Just weeks after Frederick's relocated to Leicester House, tragedy struck the royal family. Queen Caroline fell suddenly ill, her condition diagnosed as a strangulated bowel. To put it succinctly, this was a fatal ailment at the time and a painful way to pass. For days, the Queen endured excruciating agony, awaiting her impending demise. When Frederick received the news, it broke even his resilient spirit. Despite a lifetime of snowing at his parents' tribulations, the looming death of his mother proved too much for Frederick to bear. He approached his father and requested permission to see the Queen and perhaps to make amends. The response he received was heart-wrenching. The king, with Caroline's blessing, denied Frederick access to her chambers. However, she conveyed a message through him. The precise nature of Caroline's sentiments towards her wayward son in her final hours remain a mystery, but she did send a message to a politician, expressing her forgiveness towards him. Then again, this could have been a masterstroke of passive aggression of Caroline's part, effectively winning their feud once and for all. Her subsequent actions certainly seem to suggest as much. When Queen Caroline passed away on the 20th of November 1737, her husband King George II and the rest of the palace were deeply saddened. Her funeral took place at Westminster Abbey about a month later, but conspicuously absent from the guest list, perhaps as Caroline's wishes, was her eldest son, Frederick. A regrettable situation indeed. Nevertheless, the remaining years of Frederick's life were about to take an unexpected turn. Following his mother's death, Frederick seemed to undergo a significant transformation for the next decade or so. He adopted a more responsible and respectable lifestyle, settling into life at Leicester House. He and Augusta went on to have a large family with nine children, including the future King George III. Several surprising developments unfolded during this time. In the 1740s, a remarkable event occurred. Frederick and his father reconciled to some extent. While this reconciliation was primarily driven by political impendency, as the Jacobite rebellion posed a potential succession crisis in Scotland, their relationship improved enough that Frederick and Augusta became regular attendees at court functions. However, just as his mother Caroline, any reconciliation came too late. In March 1751, at the age of 44 and seemingly in good health, Frederick likely suffered a sudden pulmonary embolism and passed away while at home in Leicester House. This event sent shockwaves through the kingdom. At the time, Augusta was 32 and pregnant with their ninth child. Her world was suddenly turned upside down and chaos ensued. Augusta, Frederick's newly widowed wife, was deeply affected by his passing. At 32, she was devastated upon hearing the news. According to her doctor, she had difficulty believing it, and her attendants spent hours trying to convince her of the reality. However, not everyone mourned his loss. Following Frederick's death, his father, King George II, showed little grief and arranged a modest funeral for his late son. It seemed that the reconciliation had mostly been for appearances and George II remained largely indifferent to Frederick's passing. This fulfilled Frederick's long-standing desire to remove his least favourite son from the line of succession. Nevertheless, Frederick's legacy lived on, thanks to an unexpected source. Princess Augusta had grown considerably since her marriage to Frederick, recognising her dependence on King George II's favour to secure the throne for her eldest son, Augusta humbled herself before the monarch. Her efforts were successful, as she reportedly charmed the king to the extent that he appointed her as regent if he were unable to rule and her son was still too young. This was an achievement Frederick had failed to attain during his lifetime, ultimately contributing to his son's accession as King George III. However, in hindsight, this may not have been a favourable outcome. In the end, Frederick's lineage was met by a dark chapter. King George III, as history now knows, became Mad King George. 
suffering from either porphyria or more likely bipolar disorder, George III endured recurring bouts of mania in adulthood, characterised by frothing at the mouth, incoherent speech and prolonged periods of instability in England. This was not the legacy Frederick would have desired for his son. Remember, the stories of the past people shape our present and future. Keep exploring history and I'll see you next time on Past People.